Well, here I am with my two friends behind me, um, two Eurasian um, Griffin vultures, Griffin vultures, and I'm David Lindo, also known as the Urban Birder, and we are all together here on In Conservation With, and I'm also with a guest whose his name is Hans Pullman, and Hans uh, is a leading light in the vulture conservation foundation and also in vulture conservation per se and we're going to be talking about funny enough vultures today um but before <coughs> excuse me before we actually kick off with all that a word uh, from our sponsors uh like a sport optics thank you very much as well as cj wildlife um who for those who don't know are a team of passionate nature lovers and experts in garden wildlife on a mission to make nature accessible for everyone uh, wherever you are, a nature novice or a garden guru, they want to inspire, educate and provide the right tools to help wildlife thrive right on your doorstep. So check them out. So welcome along. Another episode of In Conservation with us, the fourth season. We're talking about vultures. Um, I'm so lucky living in Spain, especially in Extremadura, that I can just poke my head out the window and normally I can see a vulture flying over and it's kind of a, a normal daily occurrence and um i remember the first time i saw the vultures i was so excited i mean that was not that long ago and i think the actual uh, black vulture or the cenarius vulture or monk vulture i actually saw that for the first time only 12 years ago so it's not that long ago um but um vultures as most of us know have been in horrific problems um or, or globally um so hands can possibly in fact, probably shed some light on that for us. So, Hans, good evening. How are you, and where are you? Good evening, David. I'm 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 very fine, uh, thank you. And and I'm currently in in, in Holland. Uh, I'm based in the Netherlands. Um, so, working from my office from my normal day job. Now, acting as president of the Vulture Conservation Foundation. Oh, fantastic. And we were talking before we started, because um, obviously you have a website, which um, Claire, our good um, friend and, and supporter of In Conservation With, she'll get a medal one day, I'm sure, um, has probably put up the, the link for it. Um, but you were telling me about your Facebook page. Yeah, we've got a little issue with that, uh, because Facebook took our uh, page off because we are, we're posting content that they didn't like. Um, and we posted some pictures of dead animals, which, of course, fit very nicely to vultures. Um, but it was taken down as uh, um, well, inappropriate, inappropriate uh, uh, content. So we have been discussing with Facebook for a while, getting it back online, but uh, to none avail yet at the moment. It's just crazy. These people, um, you know, they 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 kind of lords lords and masters of everything as far as they're concerned. And it's okay to parade with no clothes on or or or, or threaten people and countries and what have you with murder and stuff. That's fine. But to show life in terms of natural history life, it's not fine. It's just ridiculous. Yeah, it's 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 weird and and also, because it's not very easy to reach those people in order to convince them to put the page back online again. So it's 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 actually quite annoying. So you might have to set up a new page with a new name then, or friends off maybe. Yeah, well, something like that. We're looking into that at this moment because it's taking too long to get the original page back online. Yeah, so it's that's really unnecessary. I'm sorry to hear that. Hans, you and I, I can't believe it. Most of the guests I have, I've met in some form at some point in my life, even if it's just online, but I've actually never met you before. I don't know anything about you. Um, I, you know, I don't know how tall you are. I don't know, you know, I don't know anything. So firstly, give us a breakdown as to how you got involved in natural history and in particular vultures. <laughs> Well, natural history, um, conservation, things like that, um, from from a very young age already. Uh, always um, wearing my boots and getting into in, getting into nature because that's that's something I would I, I guess I was born with. Um, and for my entire working career, I have been working in nature conservation for some commercial firms at first, but now for an NGO. 
uh, a Dutch NGO. Um, we um, we manage 64 different reserves, um, and I'm responsible for the conservation of uh, of, of those reserves. Um, so that's my normal day job, and um, as a, a voluntary position, I work for the Vulture Conservation Foundation. And I got involved with the VCF, as I call it, um, already seven years ago, uh, when uh, a young juvenile bearded vulture like, like the one I have in the back here uh, showed up not that far away from my house. And um, as a twitcher, as a birder, I went to, uh, to go see it. Um, but I also found out we, don't know, we didn't know anything on, on bearded vultures in, in Holland uh, regarding status, uh, origin, whatever. So I started asking questions. And I guess that's the first time I got involved with, with, with vultures and with the Vulture Conservation Foundation. Two questions, actually. The first, the first is a scene in Netherlands, birding scene. Um, from what I can see, there seems to be a really hot sort of birding scene there, and people are really, I get the impression that it's very, very driven to try and find new birds and stuff like that. Am I wrong? No. Um, I think it's, it's sort of the same as in Britain. There's a very fanatic group of uh, somewhere between three and 500 people that show up on every Twitch and, uh, and, and actively go search for any rarity on the islands or near the coast uh, in, in, in particularly this time of year. And um, this time of year, you've had um, obviously some good birds come through in the autumn. Um, you were telling me about a yellow dog cuckoo that showed up the other day. Yesterday, yes, on, uh, on, on the Mars flock. This is uh, on the North Sea coast, not that far from, from Britain actually. Um, but the bird was found and at some point um, uh, took flight and got um, taken down into the water by a herring gull and drowned in front of the birding audience. That must so Only 15 people were able to connect to the bird, only people that were close. Um, and today the news got out that the bird was actually found several hours before already, but nobody reported it. So that's a bit annoying yeah so i guess the 15 people who saw it must be seeking medical help now sort of psychological help because that's pretty traumatic to see your tick being killed yeah definitely um but also at some point not for the bird being killed but for actually having uh, been able to tick it some people are had a, a an actual actual great day yesterday <laughs> i'm sure yeah absolutely all right. Well, listen. We're here to talk about vultures, and I think let's 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 start talking. Let's um, let's uh, let's hear about your work um, with vultures. Um, and whilst um, Hans is getting his screen ready, um, for those who are unaccustomed to Zoom, I can't be there. Can't be anyone on the planet not unaccustomed, or shall I say, unaccustomed, unaccustomed to Zoom, Zooms. But basically, you know, if you want to watch this in its full glory, then go to Speak of You. That's a bit of a mouthful, but there you go. Ready for me? I'm ready for you now. Uh, unless I got the, the message that my host disabled my participant sharing. Oh, you know what? That is true, actually. Um, these things <laughs> happen now and again. You know, this is this is live. Um, well, I don't know, podcasting or live. Yes, I uh, I hold my hand up. It's my mistake. Apologies for delaying everyone for for two or three minutes. But here we go. There we go. There we go. Very good. Um, I would like to discuss something about uh, about the vultures in general in Europe and um, uh, our work that we do at the Vulture Conservation Foundation. And uh, in general, I have to say that from the Vulture Conservation Foundation, we have a very positive approach on conservation. There's a lot of doom and gloom uh, regarding conservation, um, which is, of course, very logical. But we try to see the highlights and the results as, a, um, uh, as the light in the end of the tunnel working towards conservation and not in general, but, but specifically on, uh, on, on vultures. Um, let me see how, if I can get this to, yes. 
Um, I think 40 years ago, Asia was the continent of vultures. Uh, you could see vultures anywhere, uh, and they were in the millions. But because of maybe, maybe uh, mostly uh, poisoning due to diclofenac, um, the, the, the decline of vultures in Asia was, was huge. So this was 40 years ago. 20 years ago, Africa uh, is the continent of, uh, of vultures. You could see still very large groups circling uh, over the savanna, over the carcasses, but also here the decline of vultures has been enormous. This is mainly due to, to, the, uh, to the poisoning, rhinos, elephants, etc., and the poisoning that takes place afterwards um, of the carcasses, because of course vultures uh, are some sort of sentinels uh, and are easily spotted. And in, in order to avoid spotting by uh, of the poachers, they, they poison the carcass. So the decline in Africa also has been enormous. Um, and you see, you see pictures like this of, of huge piles of, of cadavers of, uh, of vultures, which is of course a very sad, uh, sad view. And today, um, I think your best chance of seeing vultures is in Europe. David, as you said, Spain, uh, France, but also the Balkans is, is, is very good for, uh, for seeing vultures and seeing groups of, uh, of, of hundreds of, of griffins combined with scenarios vultures, Egyptian vultures, and even bearded vultures is not a very uh, rare sight. Um, so, um, I would like to to introduce to you to this um, this group of, uh, of vultures. This is um, this is nature's cleanup crew. Um, they clean up cadavers, dead animals, and by doing that, they they avoid the uh, the, the spreading of diseases. Um, so this is actually a very excellent ecosystem service that they that they provide, and they clean up everything until the last last bone. Well, as I said, you can see vultures mainly in the in the, in the areas that, that are um, colored red here. So Spain, Portugal, France, the Alps, and the Balkans into, uh, into Turkey. And we normally speak about four species of, uh, uh, of vultures. Um, when you look at our statutes, um, there are four species managed, mentions, but we actually have a fifth at this moment, and sometimes even a sixth. And the first one is a um, uh, scenarius vulture, or black vulture, monk vulture. This is, um, this is the big boy of the group. This is normally the one that is not the first to arrive at a, at a carcass, that are griffins mostly, but this is the strong one with a huge heavy bill that is able to tear open the carcass um, and, and reach the softer inner parts. So this is one bird that is very important for opening up the carcass and, and uh, making it available, it available also for also the other, other species of vultures that, 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 that are attracted, are attracted by, by, uh, by, by the carcass. Sorry, Hans, can I just interrupt you for a second? You're, you're echoing again. I don't know if anyone else can see that or hear that echo, but it's a bit of a strong echo. Okay. okay. I'm, is anyone, anyone else, else having, having those, those issues? issues? Can you... Yeah, uh, I can hear the echo. Okay, okay. I, I, I really, really, really don't know, know what, what to do, do on it. Um, I guess we'll just have to try and carry on and and just see if we can uh, persevere. Carry on. Carry on. Uh, 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 yeah, 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 good, uh, good word. Good word. Uh, uh, let's see, if it gets, gets too, 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 too bad, bad let, let me know, know and I will try, try and do something, something more about it. About it. Uh, um, as I, as discussed, I discussed, the, the, the most, most of the refer to the bird or the, the carcass is, is, is a griffin. griffin. Um, and this, and this is, is the bird, bird that actually, actually can take, take down, down because, because of, it, of the numbers, of the numbers that, that arrive from the carcass, tear down the carcass in an enormously short amount of time. Can can take, take down, down the carcass, carcass of a sheep within 20, 20 minutes, minutes. And, and, and and after, after um, the, 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 the griffins, griffins normally, normally the Egyptians, Egyptians arrive, arrive. And, and, and these Egyptians, Egyptians are, are um, very, very particular, particular birds, birds because, because 
Um, they, they take, take down, down the small, the small part that are still left, left. They, they are able to tear, tear the ligaments of the, of the bones, bones that are, that are, that are still, still there. there. And they, and they actually, actually clean the, the, the carcass until, until the bare, bare bone. bone. And, and this, this is, is one, one of the species, the only species, species actually, actually, that is migratory. migratory. Most, Most of the, 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 the vulture species, species do some summer movements or winter movements. But, this but this birds, birds, these birds, birds are actually migratory. migratory. This is the, the, the picture, picture of one of, one of our birds, birds that attacked with the GPS uh, uh, tag, tag. tag. Okay, hands, hands, hands. Let me interrupt you. Let's let's try it again. I think we need to bounce you out and bounce you in again. That's what we did last time. It seemed to work. Have okay. you got a headset, hands? No, but, no, but normally, normally it's, 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 it's not, not a real thing. Oh, oh, and then I'll, and then I'll be, uh, uh, we'll be doing it in any time. time. Yeah. Oh, Let's so look at Dennis's link. Sorry, sorry for the inconvenience, but I'm going to be right back. Yeah, it's just... I, so Hans is gone now, is he? Right, okay. Apologies, everyone. This um, this is something that doesn't normally occur, as you probably know. Um, so we're going to try and see if we can get Hans back. I don't understand why it's actually echoing as badly as it has been with him. And but, why it suddenly started as well, because it was fine at the beginning. Yeah, but um, very interesting subject so far anyway. I'm sure, um, I mean, I was quite fascinated when it came to the uh, the migration route of the Egyptian vulture. But um, hopefully, his hand's back now. He is, yeah. So let's see if uh, if, uh, if his oh, voice... Oh, oh, thanks. Let's see if his... Um, I was checking out the audio link Dennis had put up. I hope this is better. It's much yeah. better, yeah. Okay. It might be an issue that we have to do this again, but let's see if uh, if this works out. I, I've made you co-host, have I? Um, okay, you're co-host. You, no, I, can you please um, enable my screen sharing again, uh, David? I have, yeah. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so okay. maybe yeah, start from the, the Egyptian vulture again, please. Or even yes. Um, Egyptian vulture. Egyptian vulture, the, the, the bird that comes mostly after the carcass is sort of clean, after the griffins have, have, have gone. These birds actually clean the bones that are still left to the bare bone. They take away the small pieces of meat. They take away the ligaments that are that are still there. And they, as you can see, they have a very fine beak and are, are able to tear all those little pieces uh, pieces off. And the Egyptian vulture is the only vulture that is actually migratory. Uh, the other species do make some summer and some winter movements, but the Egyptian is actually uh, migratory. And as you can see from uh, from the GPS data that uh, that we have on, on one of our um, Egyptian vultures. This is this is the bird called Sara. She was released in Italy. She moves uh, um, back and forth to 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 Niger uh, every uh, every year and is still breeding in Italy uh, now. And um, this is the, the the bird that actually uh, cleans up the rest of the of the carcass. This is the bearded vulture. Uh, this is the one that uh, actually eats bones. Um, and the, the acids in its stomach are so strong that they can easily uh, digest the bone in order to to reach the the nutritional nutritional parts of the of the bone marrow that is uh, that that's inside. Because these birds, and it's the same bird as as, as in my background. Um, um, the youngsters look really different than the than the adult ones. And the one that is in my background, and also the juvenile bird that is um, in the picture here, is uh, our pictures that are taken in Holland. Uh, so these birds actually disperse every now and then away from the Alpine or the Pyrenees Mountains into the, the, the northwestern flatlands of, uh, of Europe. And this is the fifth. Uh, as I said, we have um, general we have four species of vulture but this is number five this is the ruppels vulture and this is a new player on the block um, and this is a bird that um, appears from from africa 
Um, and there is still a lot of unknowns on this on this species. What what does it do in Africa of in, in, in Europe? They're turning up in bigger numbers every now and then. It's not that hard to see them in Spain or in Portugal, uh, for instance, on the, on the Gibraltar Strait near Tarifa. Um, but we still don't know a lot. Is it actually breeding? Is it interbreeding with griffin? Is it breeding by itself? We still don't know. So also this, bird, this is one of the birds we, uh, we tagged in Spain. Uh, and as you can see, it, it went it me almost immediately after tagging went straight down into Senegal and Guinea-Bissau, um, where it's currently still there, and we're tracking its progress to see what they are actually doing. So this is number five and number six. This is still a rarity. We have uh, every now and then we have an African white-backed vulture uh, coming up from Africa, also with northern northern bound migrating griffin vultures into Portugal and Spain. But this is still a rarity. So, as I said, Europe is now the continent to uh, to actually see vultures, um, but it wasn't always like that. We had the same um, extirpation of uh, griffins, uh, of bearded vultures um, in the last century in Europe uh, as well. This is a picture of the last bearded vulture that was shot in the Alps in 1913. This was actually the very last bird that survived um, in the, in the Alps. So um, mainly around 1980, 1970, populations were, uh, of vultures in Europe were at their very low. Um, we had uh, bearded vultures left only in some specific areas like the Pyrenees, Corsica, uh, Turkey, um, and uh, populations were, were, were really low. And at that point, some people actually started to say, look, we have to do something at it. There were people that had, had, a, had a vision that in Europe, in general, conditions should be that good that Europe should be the, the, the vulture continent. So for instance, in this picture, there's Hans Frey. Um, he's from Austria. He was is one of the founding fathers of the Vulture Conservation Foundation. And he started with the captive breeding and reintroduction of bearded vultures in the Alps. And on, on the other, the, the graph that's shown here is um, uh, the griffon um, population in Grand Cos in, in, in southern France, where Michel Terrasse uh, started the reintroduction of these species uh, in, in, in the 70s. Um, and I think mainly based uh, thanks to these people that, that actually had a vision and, and without any knowledge on captive breeding, reintroduction of, of or whatever, actually started doing uh, the work that they did. And thanks to them, uh, we now have so many vultures in, in, in Europe. Um, and what they did, and this is the same priority as, as, as we have as the, the VCF, um, the first priority was to, to keeping the birds that are still there, keeping those birds alive. Um, and in order to do that, they had to tackle the threats that are that are around. Um, but there was also very little known. So um, they started, and this is still a major part of our work, research. Uh, we have to do uh, a lot of research in order to be able to, to tackle threats and know what causes are actually killing the birds in order to be able to tackle those. Another one is communication. Um, because a lot of the vultures got killed in the last century because of, of, of information that was not correct. Uh, bearded vultures were known as lammergeiers because they uh, threw the, the, the lambs of the sheep of the cliffs, uh, which of course isn't true, but was a, a very um, uh, uh, thought that, that, that lived in the Alps at, these days. So we're putting a lot of effort into communication and explaining and educating mainly children, but also uh, adults on, 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 on vultures and specific species. Uh, electrocution is one is, is a very big issue. Um, most of the older um, electrical wires uh, are not insulated well, and, and a lot of birds got killed because they got electrocuted. So by tackling this, this issue, um, uh, we, we, we kept a lot of birds alive. 
And the other thing attached to, to electrical uh, wires is, is collision. Uh, there were a lot of casualties due to collision of, uh, uh, of electrical wires or cables from ski lifts, etc. cetera. Um, so with, with tags like this, we made those cables a lot more visible in order to, uh, to avoid uh, collision. In some areas, also food is an issue. Um, so um, together with our local partners, we reintroduced uh, also um, uh, food. Um, see, for instance, ibex, um, red deer, um, things like that got reintroduced in, in specific areas in order to increase food availability for, um, uh, uh, for a lot of wildlife, but also for, uh, for vultures. And one thing I'm currently very proud of is the fact that we uh, are um, we have organized the Wildlife Crime Academy. Um, this is something we do with uh, the Spanish government uh, and the Junta de Andalusia, so the, the, the Andalusian regional government. Um, and they have really a lot of experience in fighting wildlife crime. And with wildlife crime for vultures, I, and one of the biggest issue is, um, is poisoning. Um, there's still a lot of poisoning, mainly in the Balkans, for foxes, wolves, bears, and um, the, the, the vultures are the, the unintentional uh, casualties of those, uh, those poisoning events. So what we do in the Wildlife Crime Academy, I just finished uh, the advanced course on, uh, uh, on it. We uh, organize, um, well, uh, uh, courses where we invite a lot of people from the Balkans, from the Middle East, from North Africa, uh, to, to educate them on, on, on wildlife crime, how to tackle poisoning, how to recognize poisoning, how to prosecute and how to persecute the different offenders that, uh, that are still there. And by that, we are building a lot of capacity for, uh, for fighting those, uh, um, th those issues in, in, the, in the several countries. And we do that with a lot of practical information. So this is, of course, theory, but mainly because we can do courses like this where people can actually investigate like a real crime scene uh, forensic and police investigation on a, on, on a casualty like this. So people are able to, to recognize um, poisoned birds, the, the, what actually killed the bird and, and what can they do to, uh, uh, to, tackle, uh, to tackle that. And I think um, this is a very big opportunity to actually keep a lot of animals alive, not only vultures or raptors, but also uh, the other big uh, predators we have in Europe, like bears, wolves, foxes, etc. Where our first priority is to keep birds alive, uh, our second priority is that we strengthen existing populations. There are still some original populations left in several parts of, of Europe, and that we are reinforcing those populations by um, restocking and reintroducing birds, griffins, uh, scenarios, vultures that are coming from rehab centers, mainly in Spain. So, for instance, this is a picture where we are releasing uh, scenarios vultures in Bulgaria. Um, those birds are coming from a rehab center in, uh, in, 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 in Spain, and the population of scenarios vultures in, in Spain is, 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 is doing really well. Um, so based on an assessment, it was stated that we can take some of those birds and release them in Bulgaria in order to, to, to strengthen the population that we have, that we still have there. Um, we also do it with, with griffins. Um, this is a project that we do in Croatia. This is a project that we do in Cyprus. This is something we do in Sardinia, uh, in Italy. So um, there is still a, a, a small population left. And that population has, of course, still the, the, the memory that a population needs, where to find food, where to nest, etc., etc. And in order to... Um, uh, to reinforce that population, we're adding birds that are coming from rehab centers in, in several parts of, uh, um, of Europe. 
And as you can see, we do that with the use of these, uh, um, these aviaries where we, um, well, sort of host some of those birds for, for a while in order to get them used to the wild population and to the area where we, uh, where we, want, to, uh, where we want to release them. And this works actually really well. You can see, for instance, in Bulgaria, those birds that we released a couple of years ago are now started breeding and are producing their own, own wild offspring uh, in Bulgaria. So that enhances the populations even more. Um, our third priority is actually re reintroduction. Uh, so where with the uh, restocking and the, the, the strengthening of uh, existing populations, we normally use birds that are coming from a rehabilitation center. For reintroduction, we normally use uh, birds that have come from captive breeding. Um, we have we manage actually two captive breeding centers in, in in Europe. We do that for bearded vultures. We have two one of those two of those centers in in Spain. One is in Guadalentín in the in Andalusia in the in the uh, near Casola, and the other one is in in, in Lleida, uh, not that far from uh, from Barcelona. And we also manage the entire um, European Endangered Species Program, um, which combines all the captive breeding in, in all the zoos that we have in, uh, in, in Europe. And these, these centers um, actually, um, well, produce enough chicks in order to, uh, to release them in several sites in, uh, in all across, uh, across Europe. And this is, this is something I, I, I am extremely proud of, uh, specifically for the, for the bearded vulture, because this is a very difficult species to breed, and you need a lot of knowledge and a lot of ex experience in order to be able to, uh, to breed birds like this. Um, last year, one of our centers got the, breed, the, the world record of producing bearded vulture chicks. They produced uh, 10 bearded vulture chicks in one, uh, uh, one center, which is an amazing result. And you get fluff balls like uh, like this. So this is uh, this is a bird several days uh, old um, before it gets imprinted with uh, with humans. We can we are able in the first week to uh, to feed it and hand rear it, um, and then get it adopted by uh, by a foster pair uh, to keep away from uh, from human imprinting, but uh, to make sure that the, that the bird has a good start uh, at first. And when, when, for instance, these bearded vultures are three months old, we, um, we are releasing them on, uh, um, on specific sites, specific chosen locations, uh, using the, the, the biology and the ecology of this uh, specific species, because bearded vultures are highly philopetric. That means that they will return to, uh, for breeding for, uh, to the place that they have made their first flight. Um, so, um, based on all the, 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 the experience we have, 85% of all the released birds are breeding within 5 to 25 kilometers of the place that they have been released. And this makes it possible for us to really um, to release those birds on specific locations where they, uh, where they are very, very valuable to the, to the program. Um, this is also what we do on, on, on Egyptians. Um, this is still, this is a bit more difficult species. We were still struggling a bit with what is the best release strategy. Um, and the idea is now that we not, do not release these birds in, in, in autumn, where they normally started their, their migration to, to Africa, but we, we are releasing them in, in spring uh, in order to have them spend the entire summer uh, in the area where they, uh, uh, where they have been released. And then after they got some experience are able to do the migration to, uh, to Africa. And of course, the, the result of, of, of things like this is, is, um, uh, it is something to, to, to really celebrate, not only because these are some great results in, in, in conservation, but be also because this is a very, 
good opportunity to involve people in conservation. Um, this is uh, the release of two uh, young bearded vultures in, uh, in, in Andalusia, in Spain. Um, and the people from the village there where we release them have really adopted these birds. So they are really um, helping to, to, to make sure these birds are safe. They observe them, they keep them safe. And this really helps in the entire conservation, not only for the vultures, but also for, uh, for other species uh, uh, present. Um, and it is this, 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 this picture, the, the, man, the, the, the man in front with the... the uh, with the sweater and the, the, the bold man a little back. Those are the most important people that we have in the captive breeding of, uh, of bearded vultures. They run the, the both of the, the, the captive breeding centers that we, uh, that we have. And as you can see, um, this is the, the, the trend of um, uh, the, the development of the population of bearded vultures in the Alps, where you can really see that the population is growing really hard. And this is mainly due to the fact that um, there are a lot of chicks um, hatching and fledging in the Alps. So there's a lot more of these birds wild hatched, wild fledged than birds that are actually uh, uh, released. This means that in the Alps we have stopped uh, the release of bearded vultures um, because the, the wild population is taking over and is much more effective than the actual uh, release. We still release some birds in Switzerland, um, but only birds with a specific genetic profile in order to uh, strengthen the, um, the genetic profile of the entire population and, and, and keep away from, uh, from inbreeding. Um, well, th this is what I said. This, these are birds that are released in Bulgaria. Um, and you can see that those birds are actually breeding on their own now in, uh, in, in Bulgaria. So after decades of being absent, being, being extirpated in, uh, in, in, in Bulgaria, um, we have now actually wild fledglings again. And this is the, always the, uh, the start of the, uh, of the real growth of the population we, uh, we have. In general, bearded vultures, we have the great comeback um, of the bearded vultures in, uh, in, in, in Europe, not only in the Alps, um, but also in the Pyrenees, which was still an original population. But the number of birds is going through the roof there. Uh, we have started a reintroduction in Andalusia, where birds are actually breeding in the wild again now. Um, we have, we see populations in the uh, um, uh, in the Alps that are that are doing really well. So bearded vultures coming from the actual brink of extinction, a great comeback story, they're doing really good. Griffins and scenarius vultures are recovering everywhere. Some need a bit help, like, like I said, in Bulgaria, in Croatia, in, in, in uh, Sardinia, um, with a little help from our side, but they are doing really well and they are, they are recovering. And the most difficult species is still is, is Egyptian. Uh, we can see that some populations are, sta are stable and even increasing uh, in Western Europe mainly. Uh, but we still have an issue in the Balkans where the population, population is still going down. Uh, and this is, of course, where we will put the most of our, our effort in, 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 in the coming years, not only for Egyptians, but this will also be the next place where we will start reintroduction of bearded vultures, uh, for instance, in order to connect the population in Turkey and, and, and the Alps uh, uh, together. So we see Europe um, as the continent of vultures. Um, as we see, as I said, uh, yes, we can. We have, we have the know-how, we have the expertise, we have the contacts, we have the network, and uh, with a, pos a positive um, the view towards conservation, we, we still have a lot of opportunities to save every species. And it is, of course, a step-by-step -step approach. And it, it takes a lot of time um, because uh, um, it, it is a long-term project. It takes 10 years for a bearded vultures after release uh, for their first breeding. So um, it takes time. And we have to remain... Um, focused on, on mitigating the threats 
for instance, the poisoning, therefore, of the, also the Wildlife Crime Academy that we're organizing. We have to be uh, fully aware that, um, uh, that if an incident of course, occurs with poisoning, for instance, we can lose an entire population within a couple of days. This is still an, still an issue. So there are also, there is a lot of positivity. There's a lot of also doom and gloom, um, but we have to make sure that we also celebrate. If you have at some point the opportunity to be just as close as I was to this bearded vulture, to look into the eye uh, and see how beautiful this eye is and how um how magnificent a species like like this is you forget all the effort that has went went into this and 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 see the the possibility and the the posi positivity of the recovery of this species and this is a bird i saw last week in uh, in andalusia in the sierra de casola uh, this is esperanza uh, and as you might know esperanza means hope this is the first wild hat bearded vulture in Andalusia since the um, the birds disappeared decades ago. So this is the first bird wild hatched coming from reintroduced parents and this bird is this year having its own nest. Um, so seeing this bird for me is 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 a very well I would say quite an emotional experience because this is the results of decades of work um, and uh, and seeing something like this flying overhead at the, at the distance of five meters, I was lucky, is absolutely brilliant. So with this, you forget all the, the, the hassle and um, keep focused on uh, on every uh, work that we uh, that we put into it. If you want more anything, um, please look at our website. I think Claire put all the, the link already uh, somewhere uh, inside follow our social media and more than happy to uh, to discuss and, and, and answer all questions if uh, if there are any. Well, Hans, thank you for, for that very positive story, very positive look at the you know, situation in Europe. One question actually, why, why is Spain so doing so well with vultures? I think it mainly has to do with the agricultural uh, uh, aspect. Um, so um, Spain has still a lot of room, still a, a lot of um, uh, 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 wild habitats uh, that are not being intensified by, for instance, farming like we have in Holland or in, in, in other parts of, uh, of, of Europe. So there's still a lot of wildlife um, that means food, um, there's availability for breeding. There's availability for 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 birds to uh, <coughs> to flee to areas where nobody is. So I think it's a combined aspect of uh, uh, of a combined well a number of aspects that that, that remain uh, good for 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 vultures. Yeah, I mean in the UK we often look at Europe and you know in terms of hunting we kind of think oh that's where it all happens it's terrible but spain um actually has a very good uh, wildlife crime record i suppose in many respects i i saw something the other day some guy got fined was it a hundred thousand euros and possibility of jail time and i can't remember what he killed he killed one bird um on his land and he'd try and get someone else to bury it or to hide the carcass um and i've been told also because i've got my friends in in uh, Euro uh, kite, um, they were telling me that you know it's a really they take wildlife crime uh, in Spain very seriously. Is that right? Yeah, that's definitely right. And uh, I have the only my own experience from Andalusia, um, where you can see that um, uh, the Junta de Andalusia, so that the, the regional government. Um, has put a lot of effort uh, and, and, and means into fighting wildlife crime. So they have a lot of agents in the fields. They have dog units in order to, to be able to, to, to track down poisoning. They have helicopters, they have drones, they have everything. Uh, so they're putting a real, uh, they, and, and one thing is really important, they have a big laboratory. 
in Malaga, where they can do a lot of scientific research in the cause of death of birds on, 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 on whatever. Um, so they have a lot of knowledge, um, but they also have um, the, the entire system in place in order to, when something is found, in order to persecute, uh, to prosecute uh, uh, something like that, in order to, um, to, 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 to punish quite severely. Well, that's a good thing. Um, Spain obviously has a thriving population. I mean, in Extremadura, there's what maybe well over four thousand pairs of griffins, and I think there's over nine hundred pairs of black vultures. So it's really, really good. And I know you talked about introducing prey species or introducing species like deer so that they can be fed upon when they die. But can you talk to us about how the feeding stations work? I know there's a few in Spain. Because I know that they were kind of regulated by the EU, or maybe I don't know what. Can you can you, do you can you shed some light on how that works? Um, feeding stations actually is quite a difficult subject because there's there's um, there's some really good pros um, because uh, it it gives an opportunity to for farmers to get rid of their carcasses in a in a very easy and and and, and cheap way. And it gives the possibility to to uh, to feed birds enough to to uh, to make them sustain through winters or or, or whatever. But we also see that uh, feeding stages um, have an effect on on the actual behavior of the birds. We see, for instance, that feeding stages in the Pyrenees uh, have a serious effect on uh, uh, breeding success and. Uh, dispersal movement of bearded vultures. Um, so the general idea was to remain, of to, to keep the possibility of feeding stations to get rid of uh, um, agricultural carcasses, remains, um, but to, um, um, to go down on the number of feeding stations, artificial feeding stations for, for specific for the feeding of, of vultures, because it's it inflicts the behavior too much. And I think that's that that's a real real issue because looking at the, for instance, the bearded vultures in the Pyrenees, um, the, the normal behavior of of, of, of young bearded vultures is, is a lot of dispersal movements, uh, not only within the, the, the Pyrenean range, but we can see from museum specimens that uh, and, and DNA analysis of those, that those birds already also disperse to North Africa, to the Alps, to the Balkans, to Corsica. But the current population does not move away from the Pyrenees. And this is a serious depletion of um, genetic profiles in the in the uh, in, in the current population. So this is a real issue, long term wise. Yeah. Well, given you know how successful it's been so far, what does this look like in the future? Because it's interesting. For example, in in the UK and Ireland, we've had uh, a record of Egyptian vulture. I think it's the first one in over a hundred years, and uh, uh, we've had um, bearded vulture show up in in Devon and sort of do. A, a trip around the UK or certainly around England for a few weeks. Um, and griffin vulture is interesting because I don't think there's been one officially since the 1800s, even though there was a claim that I know of, of six birds flying um, past Ca Cape Clare in Southern Ireland back in the 1969 or something like that. Is it possible that one day we could, for example, in the UK be hosting breeding populations of, of vultures or even the Netherlands even? For specific species, yes, uh, I would say. It, I'm, I'm not sure if I will be able to, 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 to see that happen, but um, um, what we see is we see a growing number of uh, uh, vultures turning up in, in Northern Europe. So we have groups in, in Holland, we have groups up to 100 griffins um, coming in the first week of June every year, uh, staying a couple of days and then move back uh, south because we don't have any uh, fitting breeding sites, uh, breeding locations. We don't have any cliffs. But for instance, for um, scenarios vultures, uh, which do breed in trees, I can see a long-term possibility of, of establishing 
new populations, new colonies of uh, scenarios vultures more uh, more northern than they are now. And combining with 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 climate change, I would say the chances somewhere in the far future of breeding vultures in northern Europe are very likely. Well, um, in Britain, we have a phrase um, which is um, called or the phrase is having kittens. And the reason why I say that is the fact that if black vultures became resident or, you know, started breeding in the UK, some of the farmers will have kittens. They'll be totally like saying, oh, my God, because they're saying the same thing about white tailed eagles. They're going to be eating all our sheep. Watch out for your children and your cats and your dogs and stuff like that. You know, those stories um, seem to persist. I and mean, even in Spain, you know, people... Yeah talking about black vultures you know and i've seen black vultures sitting around waiting whilst lambs are born um and i, I guess if you, to a casual observer it looks like they're waiting so they can just pounce and eat it but it might be just for the placenta yeah definitely so the, the communication education will always be an issue and um, that's why we put quite some effort uh, into it um, of course, not really in Britain so far, but if, if, if at some point uh, uh, the vulture populations move north, we will also put some effort into Britain. Good. Now, Europe's doing well. That's great. But what about Asia and what about Africa? What's the status there? Uh, it's, it's actually pretty bad. Um, we had uh, the, the entire... Oh, 99% of the population of vultures uh, got wiped away in Asia due to uh, diclofenac, which is a veterinary drug which is highly poisonous to, uh, to vultures. Uh, so it saves the cattle maybe, but if the cattle dies afterwards anyway, then um, all the vultures eating it um, are dead. And this is this is... This is and will be a very big issue, and, and I think it will be really hard to, to recover those populations in, uh, in, in, in Asia. And the same goes for Africa. Um, it depends a bit on the species and where you are, but in general, populations are dropping dramatically. Um, and this is mainly because of um, uh, the poisoning, as I said, of um, uh, to avoid those vultures being sentinels for, uh, for, 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 for the poachers, uh, for the poaching, um, but also because of um, traditional medicine, vultures are regarded, um, well, very, very healthy in, in, in some way, which is of course never proven, but, but is the issue that, that, that still remains in traditional medicine. And um, we are from the VCF, um, mainly focused on Europe, but we are helping in, in Africa where we can. We are advising on the, the captive breeding of the, the South uh, African bearded vulture, which is of course the subspecies Meridionalis, which is different than the, than the European one. We're trying to help where we can, but um, as a small organization, we still have to remain focused on Europe. Yeah, I mean, is the, is the I mean, there must be other groups in Asia and Africa trying to turn things around. I mean, is the message, the positive message getting out to the general public in those continents? Are people slowly realizing the benefits of vultures? Because I've, I've, I've uh, read about in India, how, you know, vultures by, for example, that the Parsi religion, they were revered and that you put them up, you put your bodies of uh, your, your relatives on this tower and the vultures do their work and now you know that doesn't happen anymore and people you know dead bodies have been now being eaten by dogs and rabies is much more prevalent and when you add up the cost of you know countering that it's wiped out if you had if you had vultures you wouldn't have to pay all that money so is, um, is that message getting through to the average person who's feeding their cattle diclofenic i think this is this is very very difficult um um because the situation in, in Asia and in Africa is different than, than in Europe. It's, it's much easier to, to spread those messages in, in, in Europe than it is in, in Asia and Africa. Uh, and um, I think it will take quite some time, and I hope we have that time, uh, to, to, to spread the message enough in order to, to keep those birds alive. But 
Um, as I said, I have a very positive view on conservation, but, but conservation of vultures in Asia and Africa is something I find really difficult. Yeah. Uh, coming back to Europe, though, how, what, you know, what would you want someone watching this in the future to do to help the, 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 the status of vultures in Europe and, and beyond? I would say that um, um, it keeps spreading the message that, that vultures are very valuable for, for the ecosystem. Um, they are nature's cleanup crew uh, and they keep diseases away and uh, uh, avoid uh, the spreading of, of some very nasty diseases or viruses, etc. So keep that positive uh, uh, message uh, spreading around. And um, celebrate when you actually see a vulture because it, those birds are of course very big magnificent uh, flyers and um, it's always a pleasure of seeing one even if you have been to Spain and they're flapping around you in their thousands in Extremadura um, I still rejoice uh, every bird that I actually see. Well, you know what, Hans, I'm with you on that because I feel great. And I love when I take people on tours and extra Madura and they see a vulture. Like, oh! So I, I long may that continue. Um, Hans, if you could be anywhere in the world, where would you be right now? Oh, um, yeah, that's a difficult one. I was in Andalusia last week, which was absolutely brilliant. I was in Costa Rica last month, which was also very, very brilliant. But I'm also hooked on the Swiss Alps. Um, so uh, somewhere of those three locations, uh, um, if I can go, I'll go now. Fantastic. And of the world's vultures, what's your favourite? I can guess, but what is your favourite? Yeah, well, that would be the bearded vulture, of course. Um, this is the reason I got hooked into the VCF, and I think this is a magnificent bird, a badass bird, as they say. Um, so bearded vulture for me. It's amazing when you see one, how big they are. They are humongous, yeah. absolutely yeah. huge. All right, uh, let me just tell you, Zoomers and people watching in the future, um, in terms of what's happening next on, in conservation with on the 17th which is I think next Monday 17th of October we have Bella Lack a young conservationist and activist and she's going to be talking about tomorrow's conservationist she's actually written a book about that and excuse me on the 24th of October we've got Andrew Budziak who is a photographer uh, he specializes in urban wildlife and he's going to be teaching us all about how to do that and uh, on the 27th of October, we've got a guy called Dr. Bob Plank, and he uh, was a co-founder of Zeno Canto. Some of you may know Zeno Canto. It's one of those, it's the go-to um, resource for bird sounds. And it's going to be a fascinating story to hear that. And there's a ton more people. So keep tuning in to all of the uh, in conservations coming up. So um, Hans, um, What's left for me to say is thank you so much for educating us on the plight. In fact, the the, the recovery of the vultures in Europe, which is a positive, mass, massive positive thing. And uh, let's hope we can sort of spread that positivity around the world for the other vultures in Asia and, and uh, Africa. But thank you very much for sparing your time to talk to us today. Thank you for having me, David. It's been a pleasure. It's my pleasure. And... Zoomers, thank you again for being here and supporting us. Uh, I hope that this has been an interesting session for you. And I look forward to seeing you next time. And don't forget the one golden rule we need to do here. Keep looking up.